Don't get high in the mountains on the way to your Hollywood job interview. Stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unproduced Table Read here on the Popcorn Talk Network. Um, based on my strange intro, you guys can guess that we're reading a wonderfully strange and amazing pilot today. I want to say comedy pilot because it's very funny, but I think it's kind of tough to classify. It's a drama, too. It's yeah. yeah. It, it, the, the pilot's actually called science fiction, so there's elements of that as well. Um, and it's written by the brilliant Dan Taft. Dan, thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. We're excited. I um, actually had initially booked you for another script, and then you passed this one along to me instead and I ended up really liking it. So That's, um, thank you very much. I can tell you guys he's a multi-talented writer because uh, at least from what I've read, you're two for two. So. Thank you. Um, ah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to get into it. And uh, Before we do that, guys, my name is Jeff. If you want to find me on the internet, you can do so on Twitter at Jeffrey C. Graham. And as always, I'm surrounded by a group of brilliant actors. Hey, everybody. I'm Andrew Guy. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Andrew Guy. And today I will be reading Norman and Walter. What is up, you guys? It's Dakota T. Jones. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Mr. Dakota T. Jones. I'm going to be playing Stan today. Hey, guys. I'm Adrian Snow. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Adrian Snow, and I'm going to be reading Tiff. I'm Roxy Stryer. You can find me everywhere at Roxy Stryer, and I'll be reading Officer Josie and Violet. And I am Haley O'Connor. Today, I am reading Faith and Bridget. And Dan, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for being here once again. Thank you again. I'm, it's great being here. Good. Um, one thing we like to do before we dive into these scripts is sort of let you give us a 30-second kind of intro into the world we're entering. Okay. Just kind of set the scene for us, if you would. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, basically, this is a story of a couple who've been together a very long time who are moving out to Los Angeles, um, driving a recklessly packed car, and um, they start smoking um, weed in the middle of the mountains uh, where they shouldn't be, on top of a mountain, and basically end up getting arrested in the town, stuck there by a very bizarre family. Um, the <laughs> town seems to be run by a mad climatologist, uh, and that's who Tiffany ends up working for. Um, but that's pretty much the premise. So it's, it's yeah. pretty much the, you know, a couple who's just trapped and... Uh, has to pay you take this position with this mad climatologist to pay their way to, to Los Angeles to follow their Hollywood dream. Great. Um, sounds good to me. I think with that, guys, we go ahead and dive in. Um, again, this is science fiction written by the very, very smart Dan Taft. Thanks for being here. And let's go ahead and get into it right now. Exterior Independence Pass, Colorado Day. A cheap, dangerously overstuffed monstrosity of a blue tarp scrapped to the roof of a Toyota RAV4 flaps like crazy in the wind. Duct tape plastic Walmart bags hold on for dear life in a seemingly futile attempt to keep the tarp's numerous rips and tears covered as the SUV passes a sign that reads, Independence Pass. Elevation, 12,095 feet. The RAV4's chase sits way too low against the wheels, the vehicle suspension being pushed to its limits as it winds through the hairpin turns on the super scenic yet, yet equally treacherous mountain road. Let's use Dakota. I don't like this. I don't like this. Interior Toyota RAV4, Independence Pass, Colorado, same. The inside is just as bad as the outside, packed to the grills. Betty, an old Jack Russell Terrier in a crate, which is pressed against the car ceiling atop a tower of boxes, lets out an, obnox an anxious whine. Stan Estes, the 35-year-old bespectacled, blonde-bearded man behind the wheel, checks his rearview mirror to see his precious little doggy shaking in her crate. And that's basically all the rearview mirror is good for, because he's damn sure he can't see out the back window with the cabin recklessly overpacked like this. Do you find anything on the low capacity? The anxiety in Stan's voice annoys the shit out of the cool lady in the Kangol hat riding shotgun, his girlfriend of 11 years, Tiff Collier, 32, recent college grad with a dual bachelor's degree in physics and engineering, and the Toyota's, owner, the Toyota's owner's manual in her hands. Only you would doubt an engineer's ability to pack a car properly. Tiff lovingly places her hand on Stan's leg. But seriously, you gotta calm down. This is supposed to be fun. It's beautiful. I mean, Rand McNally didn't list this as the top of their fantastic roads list for a fifth year in a row for nothing. But are you looking through the owner's manual or out the window? Out the window. <sighs> Damn it, Tiff, we're gonna die. Okay, you need to smoke. Jesus, Tiffany, I swear I'm gonna drive off a cliff here. Now can you call Toyota, all right? Just call Toyota. We have to be over the low capacity. Tiff breaks up weed on the owner's manual. He didn't even know what low capacity was a week ago. So? Yeah, and what does that matter? A week ago, we were still in New York. Okay, a week ago, I had never driven through the Rockies, and a week ago, 
Dear Lord, are you freaking breaking up weed on the owner's manual? Well, it's gotta be good for something. <sighs> you mean like finding the low capacity? Oh shit, I dropped some. Can you drive a little steadier? <laughs> Tiff bends over to pick up the dropped weed. My apologies, sire. God, forgive, God forbid I turn slightly to avoid our demise. Tiff grabs the fallen weed, but before she pops back up, she spots something. An orange sticker on the bottom of the passenger door that reads, RAV4 Limited is an altered vehicle. Load capacity, 250 pounds. Less than owner manual lists. Drive a little steadier. Huh. Drive a little steadier, my ass. Told you we, were, we should have just taken the flat highway. Okay, why did we not take the flat highway? Tiffany is wide-eyed and shotgun, shaken up by the load capacity sticker as an ominously dark storm cloud forms overhead. Honk, honk. Tiff, are you going to answer my question? He looks over to see she's suddenly just as frightened as he is. There, there is no flat highway. Honk, honk. Tiff checks the side mirror to see a line of 20 cars behind them, the driver shaking their fists in fury. How fast are you driving? I'm going like 25, 30 feet per hour. This guy behind us looks like he wants to murder us. Screw him, okay? Screw all of them. I just want to make it down this road alive, okay? Get to L.A. in one piece, okay? Is that too much to ask? I'm sparking this. She lights the joint. <sighs> really? You have to do that now. Absolutely. She exhales a hefty cloud of smoke and passes the joint to Stan, who takes a big anxious hit just as thunder claps and the heavens open up, a literal monsoon of rain falling upon them. Oh, shit. Stan hits the wipers just as his iPhone goes off. A FaceTime call from Norman, a 24-year-old Hollywood showrunner's assistant whose call cannot be ignored. Shit, shit. Why, is every, why is everything happening at once? Here, take this. He passes the joint back to Tiff as he answers the call. Hey, Norm. Tiff mm. takes another monster head off the joint, smoke blowing all over Stan's face. Daniel, my manual, how's it? Wh Wait, what is that smoke I'm seeing? Oh, it, Stan shoots Tiff a look of death. <laughs> it's, it's just, we're in the mountains and there's, there's a brush fire. Or something that's happening here, it's, it's um, sort of dangerous. <laughs> Enough said. I won't keep you. Just wanted to let you know we're all set for the interview on Tuesday, brother. Tiff gives Stan a smiling nod and a vigorous thumbs up. Wait, really? So you read my script sample then? The Zack Matterhorn Chronicles? <laughs> yeah, uh, about that. The premise, it was pretty dumb, Stan. <laughs> Stan can't help but furrow his brow. But you got that the Cat Whisperer thing was just a cover, though, right? Like, the story's really about... Yeah, the, the guy's secret identity is a double agent for the tightrope walking unit of the FBI. I know. I got it. It's just it doesn't make any sense is the problem. I told you. But, but the story's real, Norman. That, I mean, that happened to me. <laughs> Tiff rolls her eyes. I doubt that. But I, let me stop you right there, Stan. Interviews Tuesday, your quote-unquote script is not landing you the writer's assistant gig, but be there. Just show up on time. I can still try and get you in like a, like a really old PA or something, okay, bud? Stan hides his disappointment at the bad review, but still holds out hope for this entry-level position. Okay, I appreciate that, Norman. See you later. But before yeah. Stan can finish that thought, the call drops. Stan anxiously taps at the phone. Did he just, did he just hang up on me? Tiff grabs the phone, sees there's no service. No, I think the call just dropped. Call him back. Okay, can you just call him back? Why, so you can lie to him more? <laughs> What lie? That story's real, Norman. <laughs> that happened to me, Norman. You do this weird, suspiciously sociopathic thing where you make shit up for no reason, and I don't get it, and it concerns Look, me. I was nervous, okay? I panicked. It's just everything's riding on me getting that job, you know? I mean, we, we have what, like five grand total in the bank? 4,800. <sighs> That'll be gone in a month. And you just don't start your grad program until January so we can't exactly get that on your stipend. Stan's rant makes Tiff eyes go wide as she takes a much needed pull from the joints. We've got no room for error here. We really, both of us, need to get jobs in month one or things are gonna be real bad, get real bad real quick. Okay, stop, please stop. What? This whole trip you've been freaking out, Stan's blaming the shit out of me every chance you get. Like, can we just enjoy this experience together? I can't deal with your neuroses anymore, brah. I can't. She passes him the joint only to watch him shake his head as he hits it. Smoking this is not helping the cause right now, FYI. But whether it's peer pressure me into hardcore drugs or hoarding every last possession you stuffed into this death car, you always gotta push me. Okay, I am not the cheapskate who wouldn't pony up for the U-Haul trailer, but. The suspension pops. Oh, oh my, my god. god. <laughs> Stan slams on the brakes as Betty lets out a horrified whimper from her tower crate. The elderly pup shaking, in her, shaking her paws as the RAV4 skids to a halt at the edge of the cliff. Honk, honk. Chests heave, brows sweat. Tiff and Stan are speechless as they stare down the precipice. The sideways car blocking traffic at 12,000 plus feet up on the mountain. Rain pouring down. High as fuck. Shit. 
has officially hit the fan. I can't do this. Stan hops out of the RAV4. Exterior Independence Pass, Colorado, same. To furious honks. Tiff joining him on the, on the narrow mountain pass as the relentless rain pours down upon them. Stan, get back in the car, Stan. Th uh, this is not a protective reaction to what is happening right now. Honk! Tiff eyes the murderous driver directly behind them, reaching into his glove compartment for a gun. Stan. Show me a sign, God. <laughs> Show me a sign. Police sirens blare as a cop car marked Kingsland PD rolls up past the line of furiously honking drivers. Holy, holy smokes, Tiff, God heard me. <laughs> he or she or whatever is the least offensive thing to say, I guess they just sent us a savior. Stan. <laughs> Stan approaches the cop car with a shit-eating grin, his hands waving high in the air as Tiff shakes her head in disbelief. <laughs> From this day forth, I believe. Stan, don't walk over there, Stan. Come back to the car. In Come a flash, a female cop car, a female cop, Officer Josie McCaw, 40s, full metal jacket drill sergeant on steroids, emerges from the car with her gun trained on Stan, stopping him dead in his tracks. One more step to a closed casket, city boy. City boy? But I'm from Long Island. I, I mean, I, I have my driver's license right here. If you Stan will. reaches for his pocket when, boom, he drops like a sack of bricks as Tiff lets out a horrible cry. <laughs> Officer Josie holstering her smoking gun as she approaches. I'm hit! Somebody call 911. Ah, oh, cool, your jet. It was just oh. a rubber bullet. She yanks a whimpering stand up and cuffs him as she looks over the horrified Tiff. Barely glaze a little cupcake shoulder. <laughs> Tiff chokes back tears as... Look, why, why, why are you doing this to me? I, I thought God sent you here to help. Officer Josie puts her radio to her mouth. Got a couple stoners up here on the ridge talking crazy talk. Hauling one in now. Wait a second. You can't arrest him for smoking. Wheat's legal in Colorado. Not when you're driving, mouthy Mary. Gonna need a tow up here, too, for an impound. The cop opens her back door and shoves Stan inside the car. What? You're, you're taking our car. How am I supposed to get out of here? Mm, that is a tough one. Glad I don't have to figure it out. But, uh, <laughs> you reek, honey. And I can't let some high-as-a-kite city slicker drive a vehicle with no suspension. You really pushed it by stuffing that horde into the death car of yours. Here, here. Well, can I get a ride down at least? Officer Josie seems to consider that question as she lifts her hat, wiping her brow only to reveal two beyond bizarre bumps beneath her hairline with little baby antennae protruding out from under them. You're out of your mind. A shocked and horrified Tiff tries to answer, but the words just aren't there. As Officer Josie, her hat back in its normal position atop her head, hops behind the wheel. Car's full. And with that, Josie, the freakazoid cop, and Stan, the only two beings in a far-from-full sedan, are off, leaving Tiff in a stony haze of terrified confusion. Exterior, Independence Pass, further down the road, dusk. Sleeping bag and Coleman tent strapped to her back, Cooler in one hand and a leash Betty in the other, Tiff makes her way back from whence they came down the mountain. The rain soaking her, she passes a sign that reads, Kingsland, six miles. Huh. Nice try sign. <laughs> six miles, sure. I don't believe anything to see anymore. Nothing. Antenna people, this rainstorm, none of it's real. None of it. It's all in my head. It's just some part of some wild hallucinogenic weed trip. They release the wheat with acid. That explains it. That explains it. It's just some... Rocky Mountain wheat laced with some good old American LSD from a dispensary. Is that possible? Tiff looks to Betty. No answers there. Oh, a dispensary wouldn't do that. With only her trusty, unable to converse in English dog by her side, Tiff is left to her own thoughts. And regardless of whatever it was that just happened to her and Stan up on that pass, the journey she has now finds herself the journey she now finds herself on is a brutal and treacherous trek made none the easier by the car splashing puddles over her legs. Betty lunging with aggression every time any vehicle draws near. Finally, as the storm clouds clear and the emerging sun sets behind her, the road worn Tiff checks the map on her phone to see Exterior Kingsland Police Station continuous. She goes to the open door only to find that it's locked. What the? Oh, come on! Drenched to the bone and at her absolute breaking point, Tiff shakes the closed door. Hurry! Tiff turns to find Sheriff Walter McCaw, a barrel-chested man of about 50 with a cowboy hat and a piece of straw hanging from his semi-toothed mouth. What the tarnation you think you're doing, little lady? <laughs> Little lady, that's cute. Walter scowls. I guess what I'm doing, Chief, is looking to bail my domestic partner out of the pokey you got him locked up in here. You know, after the whole police brutality thing you weirdos pulled on the pass up there. <sighs> okay. First of all, it's Sheriff. He mm -hmm. taps his badge, which reads, Sheriff McCaw. Not Chief. But I appreciate the show of respect nonetheless. <clears throat> Second, if you're referencing the lawful arrest of a drug-fueled psychopath my sister just made, I can help you. 
but not till tomorrow. The sheriff hops in his car. We're closed, little lady. Closed? What do you mean closed? This ain't the city, darling. Things work a little different around here. He hands her a card, reads, Faith McCaw, bail bounds. Let me guess, your other sister? More like my dad's sister. Uh-huh. And his wife. What? <laughs> it's a little local humor for you. <laughs> Walter hits the engine. Bail's 50000 Shouldn't be much trouble for a young urban <laughs> professional like you. 50000 Walter points to the station's front doors. Be more if you damage those locks with your emotional outburst. <laughs> We can assess that tomorrow. And he's off, leaving Tiff and Betty in a cloud of country dust. Interior, Kingsland Police Station, same. A wincing Stan grips the jail bars as he peers at Officer Josie McCaw, her feet up on her desk as she sips a milkshake, pulling the treat from her lips only to laugh at the movie she's watching on TV, House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, excuse me, was someone just trying to get in here? Because I heard some sort of ruckus at the front door, I think. Shut up. <laughs> Stan gingerly pulls up his t-shirt sleeves to check his wounded shoulder. Nasty bruise. I, I think I should see a doctor for this. Josie laughs again at the movie. <laughs> I know my rights, you know. And I'm pretty sure that this is illegal. Not taking me to a hospital or something? Officer Josie pauses the movie in frustration and approaches the cell. You gonna talk over the whole thing? <laughs> you want silence? I want my one, one phone call. Off of Josie considering this, in two year Kingsland police station moments later, Stan dials a number on his jail on the jail phone, and it rings. Yellow. Call may be monitored or recorded. Oh shit. Hello. You have a collect call from Fuck. an inmate in Kingsland County Jail. A collect call. From, <sighs> Fuck in county jail. <laughs> Norman, it's me. It's Stan. Do you accept the charges? Click. Norman. Norman. Dial tone. Oh. Stan slams the phone against the cradle to wince only more from the pain of his bullet wound as exterior Kingsland, Colorado, Woods, night. Tiff sets up camp, and goddamn if she isn't resourceful. Tent goes up beautifully, sleeping bag laid out. Betty fed and happy to be in the great outdoors, completely oblivious of the clusterfuck of a situation they're in, as any dog would be. Tiff grabs a hot dog from the cooler and roasts it over the campfire as she examines Faith McCaw's business card. At this point, pretty wary of these damn macaws and their backward-ass town. But this backward-ass town is also tiny, and there probably aren't too many bail bondsmen, so she decides to give Faith a chance. She dials the numbers, and the phone rings, and rings, and rings, and that's when she notices it, right there on the business card, is in Faith's headshot. Two round birthmarks right beneath the hairline above each eye. What the? Voicemail. You done reach Faith McCall on the call bail bonds. You need a bail bond? I got some bail bonds. Let's do business, cowboy. Yeah! <laughs> what? Leave it at the beep. There's a beep and also a chorus of howls that is way too close. And before Tiff can leave Faith and her freaky birthmarks a message, <laughs> a pack of coyotes appears. Run, Betty! Tiff drops the wiener in the fire and grabs the cooler as she hightails it into the tent, Betty hopping in her lap just in time for Tiff to zip up the door, the threatening howls growing even closer. Betty lets out a whimper and Tiff whimpers right back, the two of them eventually crying themselves to a restless sleep as we fade to black. The howls pierce through the blackness until the call of the coyotes transforms into the song Werewolves of London, which just happens to be Tiff's ringtone. Interior Tiff's tent, Woods, morning. She wakes up to see a number that she doesn't immediately recognize, but she picks it up anyway, making straight streaks down her cheek from the prior's night uh, makeup streaks down her cheeks from the prior night's cry fest hello faith mccaw here you need a bail bond i got some bail bonds <laughs> tiff whines as she wipes the sleep away from her eyes oh, man, that wasn't a nightmare tell you what was a nightmare was that message you left me oh run betty <laughs> what the <laughs> shit was that <laughs> don't remind me so you need a bail bond or not because i got some bail bonds <sighs> yeah no i got that We'll be there in 20. Off of Tiff hanging up, interior, Faith McCaw's bail bonds, downtown Kingsland, morning. Faith McCaw, late 60s, a pistol strapped into her shoulder holster, stares sternly at Tiff as they sit across from one another, Betty chewing at Tiff's pockets on her lap. But Tiff is oblivious to that, cause all she can, cause all she can focus on is Faith's forehead and the mysterious lack of those twin birthmarks she knows she saw on that business card. Whew, that nephew of mine and his Yankee grudge never lets him off easy, but 50000 My Christ, that's a lot. Mm, tell me about it, sister. And while you're at it, tell me about laser surgeons. You know, any, any good ones around here? <laughs> I can't help you with that, but I can help you with posting bail. 10% is my fee. You won't find a fair one in town. Is there... There's more than one bail bondsman I can go to? Nah, ain't really more than one anything in Kingsland. It's just something I say to give my patrons some peace of mind. <laughs> 
Well, 10% is 5,000, and although I desperately want to get out of here like yesterday, I'm going to come in a little short on that. How short we talking? Interior Kingsland Police Station day. Jail bars slide open as Stan steps out, Sheriff Walter escorting him to the front of the station. Girlfriend must really love you, Sam. Paid a pretty penny to bust you loose. Whatever. Just get me my car back, and we'll just we'll be out of your hair. Yeah, that's not gonna happen, son. A horrified look crosses Stan's face as they reach the release counter behind which sits Officer Josie. What do you mean that's not gonna happen? <sighs> Vehicle is evidence, son. Earliest you'll get back is the court date. Which is when? You are to appear before the Honorable Judge McCaw exactly four weeks from today. Four weeks? Judge McCaw? A teary-eyed Tiff appears with Faith at her side. She hugs Stan, causing him to wince in pain. Oh, what's going on here, baby? You okay? Nobody probed you in there or anything. Like <laughs> oh, they probed me, all right. Probed me right out of my car. What? They can't probe us out of our car. Okay, I think that's enough probe talk for now. You can appeal the impound at your court date, so... Yeah, which you're going to need to move up because I have a big-time interview Tuesday in Hollywood. Here, here. She leans into Officer Josie, rubbing her fingers together in the money motion. And if it takes a little greasing of the wheels to make that happen... Tiff leans into Stan's ear, interrupting him with a whisper. Oh, oh, quick sidebar. Uh, bailing you out of here left us a bit dry on grease. So. Stan whispers back like everyone around can't hear everything, which they totally can. How dry exactly? Well, you know how you hate overdrafts. Oh, um, Jesus. I knew it. I knew there wasn't a Jesus. Baby. He turns his attention back to Josie. I want to talk to a lawyer now. A free lawyer, you mean? She slides over a business card for the public defender, Bra McCaw, who is pictured on the card snowboarding down a mountain. Oh, God, this family loves their business cards. <laughs> Don't call them before 4 p.m., though. The boy's big on sleeping in. Off of Stan and Tiff's furrowed brows, exterior, campground, Kingsland Woods, day. Tiff leads a whiny Stan back to camp, his stomach grumbling all the way. Freaking macaws and their corrupt backwoods ways. Shoot me in cold blood, then lock me up, steal my car. They stole our car. Uh, something's off about them. Like, all of them. I, I didn't want to say this at the station with all of them around, but... But what? An image of Officer Josie's bizarro antennae flashes in Tiff's mind. No, oh, forget it. It's too crazy. You know what's crazy is them leaving us with no way out. No means of conveyance except these road-worn feet. <sighs> Reminds me of Zach Matterhorn when he was forced to walk that tightrope over Mount Everest to save the FBI director's daughter. But it turned out it was just a heroine kingpin's son. And his feet were just bleeding all over the rope. Do you remember that scene, Tiff, top of Act 3? Oh, yeah, that was a good one, baby. <laughs> Zach hadn't eaten in days, but ignored those pains because there was a job to do. Freaking inspiring. Okay, speaking of which, how much longer do we have to walk here, Tiff? They didn't feed me one bite in that cage they stuck me in, and I'm starving. It's just over this hill, Stanny. Five minutes tops. <sighs> Perfect. How many dogs left we got in the cooler? Oh, 10 easy. Maybe 12. Nice. That'll hold us over for a day or two until we figure all of this out. But it's before just... Stan can finish that thought, their camp comes into view in the distance, and it's being ransacked by coyotes. Oh, no, 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 One of the coyotes holds the cooler open for the other coyotes, <laughs> oh. making it nice and easy for them to get all the hot dogs. Damn it, they're going to go right for the brakes. Well, we need to leave before they notice us. Betty visibly shakes in fear behind Stan's legs. And before Betty has a seizure. Tiff motions to the coyotes, who are now ripping the tent apart. Oh, she doesn't look too comfortable with this whole situation. Oh, I Gotta eat. Tiff is one step ahead of them, searching her phone for food near me. You've made that abundantly clear. And cry. As a bed and breakfast pops up on Tiff's map. The old wine and dine, of course. She shows him the spot. Let's head here. It's a mile away. Macaw's B and B. Seriously, Tiff? Look, I don't want to deal with these freaks any more than you do, but it's the only place on the map, and one of those dingoes just looked at me. Fine. But how do we obtain this meal with no grease. No, oh, leave that to me. Interior, Macaw's Bed and Breakfast, Kingsland, Colorado, day. A bell rings as Tiff walks through the door with a broken shoe in her hand, Stan right behind her holding their geriatric dog. A 50-year-old woman who looks like she belongs in the 1950s, a real Susie homemaker type, approaches the, approaches the distraught and somewhat disheveled couple with a pair of menus. This is Violet Macaw. The pooch will have to wait outside, but I can see you two right over here. Tiff fires right back with extremely convincing con with a extremely convincing country accent of her own that bewilders Stan. Oh, that sounds lovely. Just lovely. But the thing is, we're plum out of money, plum out of luck, frankly. Lost our car, lost my shoe, lost my dignity. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But we ain't lost as our work ethic. Ain't that right, Stan? Tiff elbows Stan, who is literally speechless at Tiffany's charade of an accent. He don't talk too much from the hunger. A hot meal's all he needs and some help in the kitchen. You got back that is, there is what you need, I bet. What do you say? 
Three hots and a cop for two pairs of high hands. Wow. <laughs> Violet leans in with a wink and a smile. From one country gal to another, I could use a little help. And you can't work on an empty stomach, so... Interior, Macaw's bed and breakfast booth moments later. Betty's on the outside looking in, drooling at Stan and Tiff through the window as they shovel food into their mouths. Violet drops two cups of coffee on the table. Thank you. As Stan watches Violet walk off past the table of Jehovah's Witnesses reading the End of Days pamphlets... Question, um, what's going to happen to our three hots in a cot when you inevitably slip up on this little fraud you're perpetrating? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's keep a little it quay on the all fray, okay, darling? <laughs> and with a, with a roll of his eyes, Stan <laughs> grabs his phone off the table and calls Norman. Prairie Pig Latin, exotic. You call him Norm? Yeah, like I just I used my one call from jail on him and it didn't go so well. Tiff suddenly looks pissed as Norman picks up. What do you want, Stan? I'm doing important stuff here, so make it quick. <laughs> Interior, exterior, coffee shop. Hollywood, California. Intercut. A visibly frustrated Norman awkwardly carries 12 coffees stacked on several cardboard trays out of the shop, the Bluetooth flashing in his ear. I'm just calling about the little mix-up we had earlier. I wanted to clear the air. No need. You're a criminal. Can't be trusted. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Interior macaws B and B booth same. As Tiff looks on, is still fuming about something. No, but seriously, our car broke down. You saw the brush fires. I mean, it was bad, Norman, real bad. And there was like no cell service at all. And that cop, that cop station was the only place I could call from. So your car broke down. Uh huh. And you're harassing me. Why? I need to push the interview back. Just like a month, maybe. <laughs> Norman scoffs. <laughs> uh, or, or do a Skype interview. I mean, how about that? <laughs> Classic Skyper. Interior, writer's room, Hollywood, California, same. Norman places the coffees before the writers one by one like a good little assistant. Be here Tuesday or you're done in this town. One of the writers gives Norman a big thumbs up and an impressed nod <laughs> as he hangs up. Interior, Macaws b, b booth, same. Stan frowns at his phone. He hung up on me again. You used your one call from jail on Norman instead of me. <clears throat> You're not doing your accent thing. What the fuck is wrong with you, Stan? Stan tosses his phone down on the table. You want to know what's wrong with me? I got to get to L.A. by Tuesday or my career is over. That's what's wrong with me. A crazy look crosses Tiff's eye. That cop, she didn't do anything crazy to your brain while you were locked up there, did she? Like some mind control shit? Dictating your impulses? Interfering with our communication? I mean, not, not that I'm aware of. Why? Tiff looks around to make sure no one's listening, then leans in real close to Stan. Did she ever take that hat off and get a look at her forehead? More coffee? Tiff jumps back in her seat in shock at the sudden appearance of Violet. Oh, I'm sorry if I startled you. Tiff smiles nervously up at Violet. No need to apologize, ma'am. Violet taps the coffee pot, reminding them of the op reminding them of the offer. Thanks, but I think these nerves have had enough for one day, if you don't mind. The two of us will get to work now, because like I said, if there's one thing I do well... Tiff points to Stan. And one thing this man does well... Stan nods in agreement. It's work hard. Interior macaws bed and breakfast kitchen later. Stan sits and resets with an ice pack against his bullet-wounded shoulder, doing jack shit as he watches Tiff scrub dishes with some serious elbow grease. That was real nice back there, Tiff. What you said about me to Miss Macaw? Because I do consider myself sort of a workhorse, you know. <laughs> I mean, like my whole Zack Matterhorn series that didn't happen overnight, you know? I mean, I had to grind that story out. <laughs> Tiff drops a couple of pots in the sink and kills the faucet. How about you grind a few of these dishes out? She wipes her brow as a large cockroach crawls across the wall behind her. Because the only thing working on you right now is your mouth. Oh, but my shoulder. Oh, I'm serious, Stan. Get to work now. Stan rises with a wincing groan and mans the sink. Fine. But if I'm going to work on this, you need to work on getting some emergency funds from your parents to get us out of here. Now. As Tiff sits and rests. Don't now me, Stan. I now you, not the other way around. Got it? Listen, while I appreciate this little role-play power struggle thing we're doing here, I really think we need to focus on the escape route money. Because if we're not looking at the hellhole of a town through the rear view in about 72 hours, it's over. My life, my dreams, everything I've worked so hard for, lost. Forever. So call your mom. Or your dad, whatever you gotta do. That's not gonna happen, Stan. And why not exactly? Oh, I don't know. Does a little thing called the recession ring a bell? All that money we quote unquote borrowed through that virtually unprecedented economic catastrophe that we never paid back and then school? We were like 30 when we went back. And my mom still covered our old asses big time through every semester, basically. Okay. Uh, during this recession you speak of, we invested in a primary residence with my mom, for which she put like 30 grand which she never got back. And after we couldn't cover the mortgage and she had to short sell it, her credit was shot. 
And she was broke. Yeah, well, my parents are broke now, too. <laughs> no, they're not. Even if they have something squirreled away, this isn't going to work. I promise you. But you know what? I'll give it a shot for one reason and one reason only. Because, because you love me. something very weird and scary <laughs> is happening in this town. Oh. I think. I'm not really sure, but I do not want to stick around to find out. Tiff dials her mom, Bridget Collier, with a no-nonsense Harley Davidson riding badass in her... Bridget Collier, a no-nonsense Harley Davidson riding badass in her mid-50s. As the phone rings, Tiff moseys over to the walk-in pantry, stepping inside so that she can conduct this conversation without her ridiculous fake accent. Hey, baby. Hey, Mom. A tear touches Tiff's eye, calling her mom like this, about to ask for money. Again. It hurts, and it's not good for their already strained relationship. How's the trip going? Where are you guys? Um, it's, it's going okay, I guess. You know, our, our car broke down. And... Oh, what? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, we're, we're kind of, st of stuck. Oh, no. No, no, baby, nuh-uh. Nuh-uh, nuh what? I see where this is going, and it ain't happening. <laughs> you and your pie-in-the-sky man-child of a boyfriend ain't getting another dime out of me. Tiff starts crying. But, Mom. But nothing. You spend everything you make on weed and then expect me to bail you out. Not this time. Click. But the deafening silence facing Tiff can only mean one thing. Bridget hung up on her ass, and the floodgates open, and the floodgates open. Everything crashing down in Tiff's mind at once. The car accident, Officer Josie's shooting stand and his subsequent incarceration. The coyotes ransacking their camp. And now this. With every dollar they'd been able to save up spent, they're now penniless with absolutely nowhere to turn. Tiffany sobs as she hammers the pantry wall with her fist. Why? 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 And then it happens. On the fourth fist against the wall, the pantry shelf spins around, bringing Tiff into... Interior, secret stairwell, same. A shocked Tiff finds herself at the top of a long, dark staircase. She turns to see if she can back inside the pantry from here, but there's no handle to turn, no door to open, no way out. Just my luck. She nervously begins her descent. Hello? There anybody down there? I think I made a wrong turn by the bacon flour or something. Could, could use a little help. She reaches the bottom complete darkness. There's a light switch maybe by any chance? Don't want to walk into a spider web or trip over a creepy crawly. Tiff bumps into something and a light flashes, revealing a giant roach head in a glass container. Her scream sets off a series of lights flashing on, revealing an entire underground scientific laboratory. Same. Tiff's eyes go wide in horror as she observes multiple cockroach farms, a life-size diorama of a human to cock of human to cockroach evolution, a three-dimensional map of the world depicting projected effects of global climate change over the coming decades, and long intertwined test tubes running along the walls, transporting an eerie li green liquid from the roach farms to the containers of flour, salt, and sugar. This is no ordinary science lab. It's the stuff of fiction, and it's the stuff of terror. This isn't the lab of some sane, rational scientist. The person behind this abomination must be absolutely, 100%, completely, and entirely mad. Excuse me? Tiff turns around to face none other than Violet McCaw herself. Did I hear you on the phone call when you were supposed to be working? Tiff wipes the tears from her eyes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Violet raises her hand to stop Tiff. Stop. Stop right there. Stop what? You don't have to put on a show for me. You're two reasonable, rational adults, so let's speak to each other as such in our real voices. Tiff realizes the jig is up on her country facade. I'm so sorry I wasn't straight with you. I, I'm not a country girl, as you obviously know. I'm just desperate and broke, and I was calling my mom to ask her to bail us out again. From the eyeshadow running down your cheeks, doesn't look like that call went so well. Tiff breaks down, starts crying again when Violet moves in to hug her. It, it's okay. They're there. They're there. I just want to be a scientist instead. I'm, I'm going to be homeless. Oh, nonsense. You could stay here. You can stay here and you can work for me. You mean we can keep working in the kitchen? The boy will work there, yeah. But you, you're going to be assisting me with my work right here. Tiff glances around one more time at this weird and mysterious horrors contained inside this mad lab. As long as you promise to keep it our little secret. Violet stares deeply into Tiff's eyes, awaiting her response, and Tiff nods in agreement. Fade out and pilot. I want more. I know. <laughs> um, 
Dan, thanks for letting us read this on air. It's such an interesting pilot. <laughs> Thank um, you. I kind of want to talk about your first your inspirations for this pilot because I'm sensing s a little bit of borrowing from a lot of classic. I did think of Rocky Horror. I don't know if there's any inspiration there, but I get a little bit of the two leads kind of entering a new world. I just you go ahead and talk, and I'll stop talking. But I'm curious about some of your inspirations and influences. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, this story kind of popped into my head when I was. I moved out here two summers ago with uh, my girlfriend of a long time, and we were driving across country in a very dangerously packed car. I mean, it was it was insane looking. Mm -hmm. and I'm surprised it didn't like completely fall apart on the way out here. And then it kind of just uh, that idea came to me of of basically the opening scene um, of of the pilot, mm -hmm. and that can kind of kind of grew around that. Um, I just thought, you know, a series based off of our relationship could potentially be interesting just because we've been together so long and had been through a lot together. Um, and we both were just at a point where we really had sort of very clear uh, goals, um, mm -hmm. which I thought also kind of played well for, you know, potential series, just seeing exactly what these people each wanted to do and kind of understanding, you know, being able to put yourself in their shoes and understand their motivations, basically. Um, in terms of, like, the... Uh, I am a big fan of horror, even though, you know, it's it's kind of it's it's like probably the toughest genre to find a lot of good stuff. And not that there hmm. isn't a lot of good horror, but like you do, it is a little bit trickier, I think, than other genres. But I really liked, uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. um, House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> I know it's like uh, I love that you threw it in there. Yeah, yeah. and Devil's Rejects. I mm -hmm. mean, I um, I know like for some reason that. The House of a Thousand Corpses got kind of like panned. I actually rewatched it just a few weeks ago, but I just think like stylistically, it's just like such a fun movie, and uh, that was pretty much it. Th those those were really sort of my inspirations for, and like a little Hills Have Eyes mm. type thing of mm. um, you know of just getting stuck in this in this sort of town and not having any way out, and and <laughs> being roped for you know deep pulled deeper deeper into the quicksand. It also feels kind of more like um like. Twin Peaksy type of X Files. Yeah, yeah. Early X, -Files X Files when I read it. Yeah, totally. Well, episode. definitely a fan of both those. David Lynch is like one of my favorite mm -hmm. um, creators, so um, I'm ab I'm absolutely influenced by David Lynch. I mean, that's that's 100. And I, X Files is also mm -hmm. a can show you, that I love. Uh, can you talk about balancing the two protagonists? Because it seems like it's kind of Stan's story, mm. but he's he ends up kind of. I'd say it's really way more about Tiff, and Stan's almost like the annoying <laughs> totally. side partner, you know? Yeah, Stan has a little bit of that, like, you know, Woody Allen, George Costanza type <laughs> yeah. vibe going on. But, um, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, it's an, it's a good point. I do sort of see it a little bit as, like, dual protagonists, just, you know, understanding what they're each trying to mm -hmm. uh, move toward. But I do sort of at the same time think like the Tiff character would take center stage more so and just her relationship also with Violet which I can see is like a surrogate mother you know a strained relationship with her current mother this woman kind of steps in and is like you know servicing her desire to be a scientist <laughs> even though it's down this very bizarre sort of route um, where she's like experimenting on this town and experimenting on her own family mm -hmm. um, you know she's like the idea was that she was <laughs> sort of like a Christian scientist, hmm. but like a, in a very literal sense yeah. that she's <laughs> like end of days combined with, you know, climate change and, and those types of things and has taken it to a very weird place knowing that roaches have survived every mass extinction <laughs> hmm. um, that basically cockroaches will. So and then also Stan, the idea with him is that his idea for his script is so bad, his Zach Matterhorn. Mm -hmm. script that he, he she's keeping this from you know through the way that it would project out through season one is that she's sort of keeping this secret from him that right. she's working in this underground lab even though they're like living in this bread and breakfast <laughs> um but he kind of um starts finding out what's uh, going on you know and actually starts using it to write a new script mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this thing mm -hmm. and he's keeping that from her mm -hmm. and you know she and she, and and he ends up Kind of starting to delay them staying there so that he can get this script finished because <laughs> she, the more she start the, it, it, at some point she does start like opening up to him about what's going on. He's basically using it as as material to write yeah. this this project and keeping that from her. Um, <laughs> so. I'm, one thing you do so interestingly in this pilot is just kind of walk a 
tonal tightrope. Like, I feel like there are funny parts and then serious parts. And when I asked you about your influences from the script, you cited horror as one of the primary ones. But I kind of wanted to hear about your approach to tone mm. and your approach to tone specifically in this pilot. Yeah, so um, I definitely, like, my favorite stuff that's out that I'm, like, a really big fan of personally I mean, there I have a range of stuff that I like, but I definitely like tend a little bit, I would say, towards dark comedy or dramatic comedy. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of like uh, Better Call Saul mm. and Breaking Bad mm -hmm. and uh, Fargo. The I really like the Coen Brothers. So I just sort of and Get Out. I actually thought it was really a nice blend of a lot of different sort of genres together. And I, I when they, that's executed well. Um, I think there was one too that was called like John Dies in the End or there's some oh, movie yeah. like that mm -hmm. that was also mm -hmm. like a real like genre bender and I just when it's done right I just really really like those those pieces um, so I just think I'm really into dr drama and story I love like serialized I definitely for TV I almost everything I watch is pretty much like serialized so I kind of that lends itself a little bit more towards drama versus let's say like a sitcom mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's really hard for me to not sort of incorporate like humor and like little you know comedic touches, just because I am also a fan of that stuff. So I think that kind of comes out mm -hmm. in really like everything that I that I write. Are there other versions that you have of the script that were like much more melodramatic or much more comedy heavy, and were you able to find that balance, or oh. did you just kind of just write it that way? And of this particular yeah. script, yeah. Um, yeah. no, this is really the only version of really? the script. Yeah, oh. that's I kind of. I conceived of it really on this, dr on the drive out, um, you know, and then initially it was just sort of a jumble of notes, but um, it, because I think it was based, it's like core is my relationship um, yeah. with my girlfriend, which now we've, we're coming up and being together for like 13 years. Um, that like served as like a really strong base for me to sort of work off of. Mm. Yeah, I think to me the the strength of the characters in the script are what allows you to sort of shift in and out of different tones. Would you agree with me that sort of the way you can manage a tonal tightrope like that is kind of having strong grounded characters? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think any any script in general is nothing without you know fleshing characters out, making them three dimensional mm -hmm. is really challenging um, but at the same time until you have that you almost don't have anything I mean an idea on its own to me is very valuable like a broader sense you know story or script or series idea or whatever um, but executing it requires you know the characters to feel lifelike and for people to be able to relate to them and understand their motivations and why they're taking the actions that they're taking and, and all those types of things so with yeah. your um, with your writing of characters, I I think, and this is no slide on Stan, but I think Tiff is actually the strongest written character. And I'm curious, is that is that like, did you pull from your relationship, or did you pull a lot from your girlfriend, or were you raised by women? Because I think she's, <laughs> like, I don't know for the females in the room, but like, I was raised by four women, and mm. when I read a really strong female character, I'm like, oh, this is this is really well done. But then I don't know how everyone else in the room feels about it. Yeah. For me, I felt like she was written pretty great. Thank you. And I just wonder how, as a man, did you find that bridge? Um, yeah, well, so I did. I was raised uh, to a large degree in, like, a household just with, like, my mom and my sister. So um, for at least a decent number of years. So I do kind of have that background, that experience. Um, but, yes, I mean, also, my girlfriend, I've just been with her a very long time. Yeah. And we've yeah. lived together a really long time. So I, I feel like I can um, – I don't know. I just – I skew a little. I mean, the other script that uh, – Jeff mentioned also has like a female lead and I just um, not I mean I have other scripts that don't have female leads I have male leads but um, <laughs> I, I don't know I just I, I you know I, I, I agree with you I do think she's sort of the more a little bit the more interesting character and that's why I do mm -hmm. think as the series projects out she would re it would really be centered more around her with him definitely in like a, a lead type role but more a little bit more peripheral did you have to have a, a conversation with your girlfriend like things <laughs> that she does doesn't mean that it's i think you. you're doing that honey or oh like. yeah i actually i i was about to uh, i this is probably gonna be the only reading where she has that name i'm i'm actually switching out the name <laughs> to to like trish or something like yeah. that after this which oh was that's a, her actual name yeah, so, uh, well, you know, I mean, the reality is, yeah. before the last couple of weeks, I didn't necessarily know that this script was going to get any, yeah. right, right. you know, airtime or, notifi or, uh, mm -hmm. or yeah, recognition. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, so. I noted Stan's description, too, as bespectacled blonde hair yeah. and beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I, yeah. Yeah. I knew it immediately. Yourself. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, I'm, I'm the dog. I have that dog. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so will we be reading the Zach Matterhorn Chronicles on the show next <laughs> yeah. week? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Absolutely. This is a, a very specific question, but it's kind of a, <coughs> a debate that I've been having amongst friends recently after watching uh, the WGA panel where Aaron Sorkin and Jordan Peele and all of them kind of said, we don't outline. Outlining is restrictions and it handcuffs you and, I, and you can't know where you're going on your journey before you start it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm a, a outliner believer. Uh, <laughs> just out of curiosity, did you outline? I always outline. I mean, I, I, when I, f I feel like when I first, I, you know, look, I mean, those people just are, it's very likely that they're a million times more talented than me and able to. You know, I mean, there's like the rap thing, right? With like uh, Jay Z or somebody. There's somebody who like supposedly never writes. I think it might be Jay Z. Supposedly never writes anything and just kind of goes in the booth and does it. And I think you know there are probably those level of people in Jordan Peele, Aaron Sorkin. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they're. I mean, if they're saying it, that they're totally capable capable of doing that. To me, that's like I could not imagine trying to do that. I, I real I really couldn't. I mean, I just I, I've written like I've had some outlines where they're. There's sort of like a muddy area where like I don't have it mm. so well defined in some part of it, um, but that actually usually causes me problems. <laughs> then like when I end up revising the script, I'm like, oh, that's the part that I had <laughs> no clear yeah. outline points on. So for me, yeah. um, I definitely I, I I use that. I mean, I I can't imagine doing something without an outline. Cool. You know? I know in regards to Jordan Peele, because I, I know someone who knew Jordan when he was like first starting to work on Get Out, that it seems like he's the type of person who just thinks about it a lot. And like, I know I do that with my writing. I'll just go, oh, this reminds me. Oh, this would be really good. OK, don't forget this. Yeah, he right. said, <laughs> he said a lot of his up. process looks like him sitting on the couch watching WWE. Yeah. Like, he's like, but I'm really thinking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I think that kind of comes from. But, but he's also his from the world of like improv. Yeah. yeah. And like, I feel like that also, like, I'm not from that world. Yeah. So he, I mean, people like that, I think, are, are have like, they have, you know, built that skill to basically sort of come off the fly a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't surprise me so much. And, you know, again, going back to, like, rap freestyle, like, you know, it's like that idea of just basically immediately sort of coming up with that stuff, which I think is its own skill. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Aaron Sorkin, I mean, I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can. He's a decent writer. Yeah, he's <laughs> okay. Um, it is funny, though, because... That question is such an interesting one to explore because, like, John August, who I would consider one of our best working writers, I know is meticulous about outlining. Like, mm -hmm. he will write these really deep Bibles and really, really long treatments. So, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I, I think it's for our listening writers, it just depends on the writer. To teach um, their own. And the work right. that you're doing, if it's closer to you, I don't think you really need to do it. If right. it's something where you're going off like a historical figure, then, mm -hmm. yeah, you should probably research that. Yeah. <laughs> like, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I usually always ask this question, um, and it sounds like you've never had this read before out loud. Or, or no, read. this is yeah, this is the first time I'm hearing it uh, out loud. You guys were amazing. I don't so, think he meant like seriously. it sounds like it based off the words. <laughs> yeah, no, it's from what you from, said yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, is since this is the first time, is there anything that you liked, didn't like, worked, did not work, you want to change? Um, that's a good question. If anything, I do feel like the opening scene is a little. I could probably cut it back a little bit it, it definitely runs I would say a little bit long um, I would have to look at it but I, I, I probably could cut that by at least a page or two may, maybe more um, just their back and forth although I do like sort of establishing their relationship a little bit in uh -huh. those pages mm -hmm. yeah yeah you get their banter it's clear it's written from something you know yeah there's a lot of truth in the way those yeah. two interact yeah which is really appreciated did you always want to write this as a half hour yeah, I uh, <laughs> after the other project that you that you also read, which was an hour, um, that I sort of like realized at that point, just like that, you know, the ambition levels of, of these projects. Like writing an hour is not that writing a half hour isn't hard. Writing half writing anything is sort of hard, but an hour just is like harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there's more. Yeah, I just uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean. I just, um, no, I always sort of conceive this as a half hour. Actually, the last few scripts that I've written have all been, have all been half hours. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. So, yeah. Do you picture it living on streaming? 
in like in a perfect world. I mean, I'm sure you picture it living whoever will produce it. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I definitely, I mean. It feels you know. like a binge show, like based on the pilot. Yeah. 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 So we want to keep I going. really want to know what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I love those platforms. You know, Netflix and Amazon and, uh, and uh, Hulu. That's yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 again, I tend a little bit more toward what used to be just cable. And now is, I guess, cable and streaming. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I have. There are things on network on the big networks that I do like and that I've been a huge fan of. But overall, I kind of lean the other way, and I think right sort of a little bit towards the uh, you know premium or streaming mm -hmm. yeah. or yeah. what mm -hmm. a cable whatever is not you know network. yeah it feels like the non network to be yeah. done correctly would have to be on one of those yeah because mm -hmm. I did well, kind of get a little bit of Stranger Things vibes yeah. not at all in the storytelling but just in like the fish out of water story in the discovery of something mm -hmm. new yeah mm -hmm. and that worked so well on Netflix because of the access to the next episode yeah. like. So, yeah, I think this, to me, would really fit well on, like, a Netflix. I don't know. I think it would also work on, like, Fox. I yeah. was just going to say that, yeah. actually, you know, you, you the the moment you think that, yeah, you'll see some show in there, and you're like, oh, this is actually, like, really edgy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wayward they, Pines was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was, like, a big Lost fan. Oh, yeah. Um, back, you know, when Ditto. I was on. And yeah. uh, that was, like, you know, it was, like, pretty... Dark. Some of it was dark. I mean, the, even yeah. the pilot, it's pilot, like the yeah. guy's like yeah. hanging in the yeah, plane. Yeah. And you're yeah, just like, a little. Yeah. Lucifer's yeah. like that right now. Just like people are slitting people's throats and like. Yeah. Oh, has it gotten dark? Five. Yeah, it's gotten really dark. It was and super weird. goofy for no, a while it, it, there. It's gotten darker. Okay, good. <laughs> I do love <laughs> when networks can surprise you. Yeah. Because there's something especially special about a great network show because mm -hmm. they're just rarer. So. This is us. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's um, not dark like that. No, but it's a network show. Yeah, you said. yeah. It's, yeah <laughs> the kind good of place. yeah, the good place as well. Yeah, just those exceptions to the rule, which I think this script has a lot of those qualities. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you on that. Um, any questions for us? Uh, yeah. I, how long have you guys been doing this stuff? Huh? And a year now. A, a year. day. Yeah. Over yeah. A year. I'm sure you've all been obviously acting for you know w way longer or however long. But I mean Couple specifically days. this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, but this this like network has been. So Popcorn Talk's been around for four years. It's a film interest network. Actually, a lot of people at this table host for Popcorn Talk, which is okay. kind of fun, because we have a bunch of different shows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is our table read show, mm -hmm. and it's about a year old. And yeah. it's been yeah. a fun adventure. It's yeah. been really fun. I'm always so impressed by this group of actors surrounding when me. When is so. our anniversary? I think it might have happened. It already happened. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah, in January. Oh, guys. Yeah. Um, but we're coming up we're on 50 shows, so I want to do something yeah. special for our 50th, for it's, sure. It's a real treat just, I mean, a lot of people are also writers that are actors here, but it's great just as an actor to, like, pick a writer's brain about, mm -hmm. huh, what were you mm -hmm. thinking about this character? Yeah. How does that work? It is like, it feels like the secret golden ticket to like yeah. know yeah. what were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I, lo I love talking about it, so it's, cool. it's fun to do. Well, you're a friend of the show, Dan, so anytime <laughs> you want anything else read, please send it my way, and we'll figure it out. Um, thank you. But in the meantime, guys, this has been the Unproduced Table Read. Thank you so much for joining. Today we read um, a half-hour script by Dan Taft called Science Fiction. Um, I hope you write more, because I'm really curious to see where it goes. If you like today's show, um, I think I'd recommend a script we read last year called The Hunter and the Mystic, mm -hmm. um, just because mm -hmm. it's also set in sort of a strange mountain community. So if you're into those kind of eccentric southern characters, kind of the southern gothic, even though Colorado's not really in the south, but <laughs> um, the American heartland gothic, check that out. Um, we are here every Friday, you guys. If you like what you're hearing and you like what you're seeing, one way you can really help us is to hop on iTunes and rate the show. Um, I've been noticing the number of ratings we're getting is slowly going up, and we really appreciate those reviews. Woohoo! Um, if you're a listener and you want to pitch me a script, please reach out to me on Twitter. I will get back quickly. And um, keep tuning in, guys. We've got a half hour kind of comedy, freeform-esque <laughs> um, show next week. It's a um, coming-of-age high school story that I think is really, really nice, written by an after buzzer. So that's next week. It's called Higher Grounds, and we'll see you then. Um, how about the rest of y'all? Uh, I will not see you then, but it sounds like it'll be a great script. Should be a good show, uh, yeah. I'm Andrew Guy. Thanks for watching. All right, guys, you guys can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Mr. Dakota T. Jones. I'm Adrian Snow. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Adrian Snow. You can also tune in to After Buzz for the Magicians After Show on Wednesdays with me. Roxy Stryer. You can find me at Roxy Stryer. Hey, I'm Haley O'Connor. That's Haley with two Y's. If you don't use two Y's, you're not two Y's. That is Haley O'Connor on Twitter and Haley Wood on Instagram. And Dan, for the executives who want to buy this thing, where can they find you? Uh, you can reach me through 
Twitter, uh, Tafty Two Fingers. Um, <laughs> yes. Or I, I type with two fingers. I, I don't, you know. I love I it. I don't know how to do the, the right thing. <laughs> nice. Um, or uh, actually right now I'm on, on the blacklist, so if you want to um, contact me through there. I can be reached through there, through there as well. No big oh, yeah. deal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, interestingly, I just learned Greta Gerwig writes on legal pads. She like really by yeah. hand. God. Yeah. So wow, you're not alone in your like unconventional. The worst. <laughs> yeah. She's the best, but that's yeah. the worst. Yeah. <laughs> um, off that, guys. Um, <laughs> so we'll see you next week at 10 a.m. And thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.